So about a month ago, I was deep in the archives reading about radiation shielding when I came across this fun little paper where they took concrete and mixed it with a special compound called barium sulfate and ended up with some pretty decent radiation shielding. And my first thought when I saw this was, what if instead of mixing it with concrete, we mixed it with 3D printing resin? And then you could like 3D print radiation shielding. That'd be pretty cool. But I kind of just forgot about it because I don't actually have a 3D printer to test it out on. I can use the 3D printers at our university's makerspace, but they're not going to let me just dump random chemicals in there. I checked. Tungsten is one of the best radioprotective materials that we have. That's where this 3D printer and this experimental new filament comes in. Prusa sent it to me because they have come up with a tungsten-infused filament specifically for radiation shielding. All right, let's check this out. It's 75% tungsten. Tungsten's good. That doesn't actually seem very good at all, but I'll get to that later, I guess. I'm mad that they stole my idea, but... Like, let's see how expensive it is. Are you serious? I bet I could build better shielding for, like, way cheap, like $25 or something. A kilo? $220 a kilo. What the hell? Prusa, no. So there's actually only about four different types of radiation that we'll sort of normally deal with. You've got alpha radiation, beta radiation, gamma radiation, and neutron radiation. Now neutron radiation is just neutrons and they're just by themselves. It only really happens inside like nuclear reactors. So even though it's hard to stop, we're not going to worry about it. Alpha particles are little bundles of two protons and two neutrons. and it's basically the same as a nucleus of a helium atom. They're pretty common, but they're also really easy to stop. They can only make it at like five centimeters in air or something. So we don't have to worry too much about them either. Beta particles are just electrons that are going really fast. They're also pretty easy to stop. Again, you don't worry about them. But gamma radiation is the big deal. So gamma radiation is basically just light, but it has a ton, a ton of energy. And it sort of varies depending on how high energy it is. So very high energy gamma rays will be much harder to stop than very low energy gamma rays. But all in all, it's still pretty hard. And this is sort of the main problem that radiation shielding applications have to deal with. And so it's what we're going to try to stop. So if we want to stop gamma radiation and actually make, you know, some kind of shielding where we have, you know, loads of gamma rays coming in and only a couple coming out, what we need to do is have atoms inside our material and we want the gamma rays to interact with those atoms. So there's a variety of different interactions where a gamma ray somehow transfers its energy to an atom and this is how we actually have a shielding effect. So the two things that we can do to make this as likely as possible are to have lots of atoms to basically increase the chance that our gamma ray will hit at one and we can also make it more likely that these interactions will even occur in the first place. So if you know, a gamma ray is sort of approaching an atom, what is the probability that it will actually be stopped? That is going to depend primarily on the atomic number of the atom. So there's these two things. We want lots of atoms, which corresponds to density. So we want very dense materials. And we also want materials with a very high atomic number. So those that are at the sort of the end of the periodic table. It turns out, thankfully, that a lot of high Z materials, so materials with high atomic numbers, also are very dense. So this is really the main sort of criteria that we want to work on. And the reason barium sulfate is good radiation shielding is because barium is a very high atomic number. And tungsten is also quite good. Bismuth is another good one. You've probably seen like lead radiation shielding. Lead also has a very, very high atomic number. So my idea was to 3D print not the entire thing, but just like a shell which I could then fill with some kind of radiation shielding plaster that I made. Then I could put a radiation source above it and slot in a detector below it and measure the effects of this plaster 
and I could also put it in more or less any 3D print. But now I need a source of gamma radiation, and it's not like you can buy them for $7 at Home Depot. You know, surely you wouldn't be able to buy one for $7 at Home Depot. So remember alpha radiation, which is just two protons and two neutrons, and it's pretty easy to stop? It turns out that it's so easy to stop that smoke particles just in the air can stop it too. So if you have a source of, you know, alpha particles and a little chamber where smoke could go if there was smoke, and then a detector, you can actually detect smoke that way. And that's how a certain kind of smoke detector called ionization smoke detectors work. But what matters for us is that you need that source of alpha particles, which is usually the isotope americium-241. Americium-241 is radioactive, which means that its nucleus is in some really, you know, unstable high energy state. And it's going to eventually decay, and we're going to end up with a nucleus that's of a totally different element, so a different number of protons and neutrons. We're gonna get there by releasing that energy in the form of an alpha particle. So those two neutrons and two protons are gonna escape, you know, as an alpha particle out of this process. But we're not done yet. As far as smoke detectors are concerned, we're done. But this is not a stable state yet. We would call it a metastable state. And so usually write this something like 237M Neptunium, because what will happen is even though the number of protons and neutrons is right, we can still sort of rearrange the nucleus to end up in a lower energy state. And when we do this, when this transition eventually randomly happens, it will release gamma radiation at about 60 kilo electron volts of energy. And so even though they're really alpha sources inside of a smoke detector, they're also secretly gamma sources. <laughs> My first plan was to just mix it with flour and water in order to create a plaster material, but first I wanted to make sure that mixing flour and water could actually make plaster. The little convenience store didn't have any flour, I couldn't find any. Um, but they did have pancake mix, and that's probably close enough. It's, it says it's basically just mostly flour. This is such a stupid idea. I love this so much. Anyway, fuck it, we're doing pancakes now. So I mixed up pancake mix and water and it made a pretty decent plaster after a day and a half. And so I tried it again with some barium sulfate that came in a very, very not sketchy bag of white powder. And it's very heavy. It's good. And it seemed to work pretty well. So you can see the little chunks sitting on top there. And uh, yeah, that's the thing going off. And I've been taking data for a while now. And I got this. It actually works. I made radiation shielding out of bloody pancakes until a week later. The smaller sample looks fine. But then if you look closely, there's some black stuff, which is weird. And you can see quite a bit more of it here. And it does kind of look like mold, which I honestly probably should have guessed, given I basically just made pancakes and left them out for weeks. So that was a fail. On to attempt two. Now that I was using a big bucket of real plaster and was actually going to measure things out this time, I figured I should probably do it outside. The only problem is that since I'm in the dorms, I ended up doing it like by the sidewalk in the middle of the night. Don't worry about it. This isn't sketchy at all. Everything about this project is very above board. I also put it inside actual 3D prints to test it out. And they looked really nice and clean, so I threw them in the Geiger counter setup, and when I took some data, it actually worked really, really well. But I still don't know if it's better than Prusa. Now, the way we usually quantify how good or bad radiation shielding is, is with what's called the half value layer which is basically just how thick of a layer do you need in like, you know, millimeters or whatever in order to have half of the incoming gamma radiation 
passed through. And Prusa actually provides this number on their website. But remember when I said very high energy gamma rays will be much harder to stop than very low energy gamma rays? The number on their website is for 140 kilo electron volt gamma rays, which are much harder to stop than the 60 kilo electron volt gamma rays that I'm testing with. And it's not a linear relationship. The relationship between energy and half value layer is extremely complicated because of all those different interactions that can occur to actually stop these gamma rays. So we have to figure out the half value layer ourselves, And this is where Prusa starts to look a little bit sleazy, to be honest, because although they say that their filament is, you know, 75% tungsten by weight. So you've got, you know, your here's your bunch of tungsten and here's all the other stuff. If you were to put it on a scale, you know, 75% of the mass would be on the tungsten and the other stuff would be 25%. You have to remember that tungsten is way, way more dense than plastic. So if you were to look at it in terms of volume, it tells a very different story. So even though its actual mass or weight is 75% tungsten, it's only a teeny, teeny bit of tungsten by volume with a huge amount of other junk. And if you do the math, it's actually about 16% tungsten by volume, which for the purposes of radiation shielding, this is what actually matters. So what we can basically say is that it's roughly 16% the effectiveness of pure tungsten. The other components do block radiation a little bit, but it's not enough to really matter at all. And then we can use this in conjunction with the fact that you can just look up the half value layer of pure tungsten on the NIST website. They have it at any energy. So you can we can do this at 60 kilo electron volts rather than the 140 that they used. And if we put these together, we can get a pretty decent estimation of the half value layer of the Prusa filament. And that's what I'll use to compare against. I lose by a lot. My stuff is garbage in comparison. But like, I mean, I don't know what to do. Like, I have to use barium sulfate because I need a powder. How am I supposed to compete with, you know, pure metal? How am I supposed to put metal in a 3D printed shell? I mean, surely I couldn't put metal in a 3D printed shell. What we need is a metal that has a very high atomic number, which will make it good radiation shielding. We also want it to be dense, but those, again, kind of go together. And then we also want it to have a very low melting point so that we don't have to get it that hot for it to become liquid. Because if we're going to pour liquid metal into a 3D print, we need that liquid metal to not just immediately melt and obliterate the plastic. There's a couple of elements that stand out. The two best ones are lead and bismuth, which are actually just two of the best for radiation shielding in general. Lead is toxic and sucks. But bismuth has a melting point of about 271 degrees Celsius, which is pretty good, but would probably still destroy plastic. It's also kind of expensive. It's close, but not quite enough. Pure bismuth has a melting point that is 271 Celsius. But what if we were to mix it with another metal, say tin? Now tin has a melting point of about 232 Celsius, and it doesn't really help us with radiation shielding much. But it turns out that if you make an alloy of tin and bismuth, so you mix them together, you have a curve of melting points that looks a little bit like this. So the lowest melting point you can have isn't pure bismuth or pure tin, it's a mixture of them both. In this case, that minimum is about 58% bismuth, and that minimum temperature, the minimum melting point, is about 139 degrees Celsius, which is ridiculously low. This alloy with the lowest possible melting point is known as a eutectic alloy. The 139 degrees Celsius is great for not obliterating plastic. It's still a good percentage of bismuth, which is good for radiation shielding. And the other thing is that bismuth is a lot more expensive than tin. And so having a decent percentage of not just bismuth, but also tin, is good for it not costing a ton of money. So this alloy, which is, you know, 58% bismuth, and 42% tin turns out to be available just on eBay and whatnot as fishing weights. So I bought one. I mean, it's time to see if fishing weights can succeed where pancake mix failed. You can see that it melts pretty easily with just a soldering iron. So that's what I ended up using. Yep, my phone dropped into a pile of molten metal and somehow was perfectly fine.
it's, it's four in the morning. The test just finished. So I gotta go. Fuck. Go load it. That's pretty, pretty good. All right, now for the moment of truth. How does the half value layer look? <sighs> yes, 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 yes. Yes, oh my gosh, I did it. I beat Prusha. Now I really, really need to go to bed. <laughs>